Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rethinking Sourcing from North America, part two. Uh, we had the part one discussion on Tuesday. Um, so, so some of you who have may return for part two, welcome again. For those of you that are new, uh, thank you for joining us. It is July 2nd, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. So one of the questions and one of the topics that I have seen a lot of discussion around in a lot of articles is, is apparel manufacturing coming home? And in the 2019 McKinsey State of the Fashion Report, um, during a survey result where they uh, did a poll for uh, apparel sourcing executives, 60% of the executives said that 20% of their sourcing volume will be from near shore by 2025. So here we are halfway through 2020 and many are thinking or planning that they will be doing more nearshoring in the next five years. Now, what does that mean for the US manufacturing industry? I wanted to provide everyone here with some basic information on what that looks like in the US. So in looking at NCTO, they, uh, there's a chart that contains all of the shipments from 2009 to 2019. And you can see that there's been a lot of fluctuation. Um, in 2019, it was about $76 billion worth, and that's including fiber, yarn, fabric, apparel products. Now, $76 billion may seem like a lot, but for comparison purposes, I have included the numbers for China. In 2019, China exported $151 billion of ready-made garments. That's not even including all of the other components um, that, are, you know, that are used in our industry. So this is what we're able to you know, handle now. Are we able to handle more? Is there more potential, more room? That's one of the things that we're going to touch on today. Now, also, when we look at the geographic location of where our manufacturing industry is for the textile and apparel sector, Otexa um, put this, uh, taking the database, they put this information together. And they looked at all kinds of different states. And number one, when they looked at yarns, fabric, textiles, and apparel, Whoever ranked number one, that's where they found the most of the companies and organizations being based there. So for yarn, I think that's no surprise. Um, the majority of it is in North Carolina. We know that historically in this country, there's been a, there was a lot of uh, textile mills in that region. Now, when you look from fabrics forward, fabrics um, and apparel, California is at the top of every single one of those. And so some of you, most of you, I think, would know that, that uh, in California, you can do, you can find a lot of organizations there that are doing knitting and also garment manufacturing. So this just gives you an idea of the lay of the land here in the U.S. in terms of manufacturing for our industry. Now, a lot of times the conversation is kind of like, uh, the chicken and the egg, right? You have to have the manufacturing and then the brands will come or the brands have to request it or seek it and then the investment will come. In my search for uh, brands that are manufacturing here in the US, I came across, you know, I think most of us are probably familiar with who those players are, but what really surprised me and I, I wanted to share with you here today is I went on Nordstrom.com's website and they actually had, a, you can search for made in USA. And I was really impressed. I was like, oh, okay, this is new. And when I filtered out just women's apparel, I saw when I looked at the number of items that they currently have, that's over a thousand items that they had on their website that claimed to be made in the USA. And now, I know on here it looks very small. I just wanted you to get an idea that it's denim, dresses, intimates. And so a lot of the brands are brands that we all know and love, like Aloe and Commando, Cotton Citizen. 
denim companies like Mother and Rag and Bone, Reformation, Splendid, Spiritual Gangster, Daydreamer. So this is really impressive. And I think that um, as we continue our conversation, where we often ask, well, which is going to come first, I felt like this is important to share. And I think it's definitely an important part of the puzzle. So with that, I thought it would be great to have a, a group of, you know, industry professionals that cover every segment of our industry, from yarn to fabric to garment manufacturing and a brand. So I'd like to introduce to each one of you, uh, David Sasso from Bueller Yarn, from, he's based in Georgia. David Roshan from Laguna and Viral Fabrics, he is based in LA. Marta Miller, with Lefty Production Company, also in LA, and Megan Eddings with Marine Layer in San Francisco. And now I'd like to invite each one of you to explain to our listeners a little bit more about your organization. We'll start with Bueller. Hi, uh, thank you, Sharon, for the opportunity to, to share our company and uh, hopefully the, some of the insights that we have from uh, a yarn spinner's perspective. Um, we are a small spinning mill in Jefferson, Georgia, about one hour uh, northeast of Atlanta. Uh, we have been here since 1996 uh, through an investment of a Swiss company called Herman Bueller. Uh, we started out uh, in Georgia spinning really fine counts for the sheeting industry. Um, by 2001, when China entered the WTO, we went from 99% sheets to 95% knits. So we had to do a very, very quick uh, transition from wovens to, to knit apparel. Um, we're not as big as some of the other spinners. Uh, we do about six and a half million to seven and a half million pounds a year. We're known for our Modal, uh, Tencel, and Supima uh, yarns. Uh, currently, is uh, the majority of the yarn spun is ring spun variety, but we have added Vortex, and we are at, uh, have added more capabilities to run other or spin other fibers uh, and blend with those particular four fibers. Um, our business is uh, around half and half, 50% uh, exports and 50% domestic. Okay, thank you, David. And next we have the other David Roshan with Laguna and Viral Fabrics. Hi, uh, thank you for having me as a panelist, Sharon. Um, Laguna Fabrics is a domestic knit factory uh, specializing in novelty, sustainable knits. Uh, we cater mainly to contemporary and athleisure markets, and uh, we're known for our, our quality of our fabrics, our sustainability, and our speed to market. Great. Thank you, David. And next, we have Marta with Lefty Production Co. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, so nice of you to put this together. Um, so I own Lefty Production Co. Um, we handle the development of the product, so the pattern making, sample making, fitting, marking, and grading, and the development aspect of being able to do it, helping people, you know, find the two Davids um, and kind of guide them on the process and do a lot of kind of consulting through that. And then ultimately, we manage their production and the supply chain. I also have this slide here. And then uh, next we have Megan Edding with Marine Layer. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm with Marine Layer. We are a California-based casual lifestyle brand. We were founded 10 years ago and have just under 50 stores across the country. Um, our stuff is known for being super soft. So we make all products categories from t-shirts to fleece, um, outerwear, jackets, dresses, pretty much anything that you would want to wear in what we call a seven day weekend, um, which we all love. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to jump to the next slide. We were founded 10 years ago um, and started with just t shirts. So um, this story is our CEO's wife now, then girlfriend, threw away his favorite t shirt and he was 
baffled that the softness and comfort that he had in that he couldn't find anywhere else in the market at the time. So that is what started it, and then it has just turned into the lifestyle brand. Our target customer is fairly affluent, um, making about or above 150K, um, mainly living on coastal or major populated cities. Um, most of them have a college degree and are from 25 to 45. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, and now that we all have this information, we can jump right into the discussion. So um, in thinking about, you know, all of the information that we've been seeing about sourcing from North America, I think ideally anybody would say, yes, we should be making more from here. You know, I definitely want to buy more stuff made here. But at the end of the day, you know, in the past few years, like I showed the chart with all the shipments, that's huge fluctuations and how we hear a lot that at the end of the day, brands or even the consumers, it comes down to price. So I know that that's probably, you know, I would say that's one of the biggest challenges about sourcing from here, but I'd like to hear from you guys that are making things here. What would you say to our listeners as to what is one of the benefits of sourcing from North America and having products made here? Go ahead, Marta. Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're entering just such a different time. Um, I think a lot of people care a lot more about sustainability, which is a wonderful thing. And when you think of sustainability, you also want to think of inventory management. And when you also are, so you're looking at inventory management and you're also looking at a lot of direct to consumer sales. And, you know, people not wanting to have to do 60% off, 60% off, 60% off, and really just going direct to consumer and not just flooding them with the same thing and giving them a new product very often. Um, I think that is very important because, you know, with Instagram and social media, when people are shopping, it's a totally different experience. You're targeting them and you want to give them something else to target. And so, I would say that the speed to market and the ability to get back into something that's popular is a wonderful thing, um, as opposed to having to bring in, you know, 5,000 units and hope and pray, and then sometimes having to mark it down. So I think that if when brands start to look at their risks with inventory management, then they start to be able to see the benefits of doing it domestically. Yeah, that's actually something that David Sasso in part one had brought up how the goal is to obviously sell it at first price. We, you know, the industry has gone into this mode where everything, you know, and in, in the consumer expects the sales and, and waits for that, right? And there's, it's always promotional and it ends up hurting the industry in the long run. Um, I'd like to to add to um, what Marta had, uh, had said. Um, I was lucky enough uh, to join Bueller when uh, Supima started to become more of the thing. Um, we started out basically with the LA brands. Uh, remember, we said I said that we went from 95 to 99 percent wovens to 95 percent knits. Most of that came from the demand of Supima Yarns in LA. Uh, Michael Stars, James Purse, Three Dots. Every brand uh, in LA had us on the books. And what was so wonderful to see was they were very successful making a great product, but the design capability of LA was just tremendous as compared to East Coast. And there's nothing wrong with East Coast. There are some good people there. But the focus of LA had this, the, the, the design, which needs speed. Uh, when you design something, it became that impulse buy. I remember uh, uh, the, the story about Michael Stars at Nordstrom sold that you'll never sell a $100 t-shirt. Well, they were wrong. 
they could sell a hundred dollar t-shirt. It's because the design, right? Um, and this is where I like to get to the point where it's not about the yarn price or the fiber price. That's nothing compared to what you get in return for selling a great product. Um, making good decisions about fiber, spin, and, and yarns uh, are key foundations for your design, but it shouldn't be your determining factor of how do I design the cheapest, uh, the cheapest way. So I think we need to get back to that. I think technology and the speed and information that we have will help us do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, David, just unmute yourself. So I, another benefit now is that the, the consumers are asking for um, domestic production, domestic fabrics, domestic garments. Um, this is a mask, I don't know if you can see it has a, a American flag on it. Every time I wear this mask, Every time I wear this mask out, people ask me where I got it and are, 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 uh, want to buy it. Um, so people are looking for domestic production. They realize how important it is to have a, a, a U.S. production base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think a lot of that has to do with the COVID um, effect, right? Where all of a sudden here we were and how hard was it to get wipes uh, gloves, right? How hard was it to, you know, and initially masks, right? All of the things that we have always depended on for overseas. Quickly, the industry was able to make these things. I think now you can find whites, I don't know, um, gloves, but the, I think consumers realize the dependency that we have. And one of the data points that I shared on Tuesday was in, serve, in consumer surveys, there was information saying that consumers are hesitant and no longer want to see made in China, made in China. So that's an interesting point about your mask and maybe more patriotism, you know, is on the rise. I don't know. So um, yeah. one of the things too, you know, now that I mentioned um, the pandemic, um, what that really showed is it really exposed the strengths and the weaknesses of a lot of organizations. And it still continues to do so till this day. You know, we're still all navigating and trying to figure things out. And so the main thing is that agility is key for success. And what I'd like to um, hear from each one of you is if you can explain or share a little bit more about how um, agile is your business for your customers. I'm happy to start. Um, marine layers had to be incredibly agile from how we're operating and trying to develop clothing and work with our partners. Um, one of the benefits of LA, and we, we manufacture a lot in LA, I think the customer definitely values the made in USA. And um, in addition to some of the sustainability benefits, right? Like close mm -hmm. sourcing, less carbon mm -hmm. footprint. I think that there's a lot there. Um, but I'm on the phone with my factories all the time, uh, human to human. And I think one of the things that changed as Corona really took off is obviously face masks. We actually were able to pivot and produce thousands and thousands of face masks very quickly um, with one of our LA partners, just because we had that relationship and connectivity and could get them on the phone and could get them to market within two weeks. Um, so that was, I think, huge for us coming out of the pandemic. Um, but just, you know, being able to talk to people real time every day when you're manufacturing, because we do make some stuff internationally as well. Um, there's this lag of getting answers. Everything's a day or two days. And um, with the pandemic hitting different places in the world at different times, uh, there's there's multiple waves that I'm navigating from. We do produce some in China and we produce some in India. And, and it's just nice to have um, local support that you can lean on and leverage as you're moving through this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Can you share a little bit about how agility? Please go ahead, Martha. I think also, you know, we're seeing I go back to um, what David mentioned, you know, Nordstrom told Michael Stars he could never make a, he could never sell a $100 t-shirt. There was, there was a time not too long ago, 
almost seven, eight years ago, where in order to be a brand, you had to know a buyer, you had to have friends with somebody at Barney's, you know, that was, that was how you built your brand. Now it has nothing to do with that. And so as you know, wholesale is changing so much and stores are changing so much, um, the volume that somebody wants to commit to, you know, in a certain style when maybe they don't have brick and mortar behind them um, and they're just, you know, able to say, no, I can sell a hundred dollar t-shirt because I'm an influencer, because I have something interesting to say, because I connect with my audience directly. Um, those people can, but maybe they only want to sell, you know, maybe they only want to buy 200 t-shirts um, and see how they do. And they don't have any, you know, stores behind them to bring that up to a thousand t-shirts. And once you start to do the math and you're not giving your factory overseas, you know, three, 4,000 units, the math just stops working, I think, also. And so then it becomes way more economical to just keep it stateside. Mm -hmm. Any of the data want to share anything about? So it, it also gives, uh, gives brands the opportunity to test the market with smaller runs, mm -hmm. accommodate the smaller runs where they could, they could test a lot more styles uh, and then jump on the bigger, um, the, the ones that hit. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know, I I love hearing all of the pluses and totally agree with you about the agility. But what I'm curious to know too is what are you guys hearing from brands who, yes, this is all great, but if you had a program with them and then uh, they had they all of a sudden move it to the Far East, what is what is usually the reasoning that you're you're hearing? I think the the bigger the brand or retailer, um, the more focused they are on price um, and bringing it over to this hemisphere. They're not focused on so much uh, the turnover that they can achieve, the changes that they can achieve by being close, the communication. Um, you know, so uh, the bigger you are, the harder it is to see the benefits. Uh, the smaller you are, where you can be agile and make sure you're you're getting that uh, first price. Um, I think uh, our industry average in retail is our first price is only 35%. Uh, where Inditex was at uh, 85%. Uh, well, what's the difference between Inditex, uh, how they do business versus how we do business? Uh, and I think there's a, a speed factor behind that. And there's a understanding the customer behind that. Uh, so that they can uh, turn over faster, right? More options. And let's be honest, I think speed's going to be coming more and more of a factor because we have more options and more ways to buy. So predictability is shot. So now we need to go and do our homework. What is that? What strikes the consumer? What in, uh, motivates them to buy and not worry about oh, I can go find it $10 cheaper over here or there, you know. I want to buy it because I like it. This is what I want. And that's where the designers and the, the brands and retailers really, really need to, to focus on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of the direct-to-consumer brands have really seen the value in producing domestically. You know, in, in the speed to market like we've spoken about and, and jumping on the trends and, mm -hmm. um, and so on. Megan, for you, how do you um, at Marine Layer differentiate between which programs you can do uh, domestically uh, versus which ones you'll do overseas? Yeah, a lot of times it's driven um, based on quality, actually, where we think we can get the best quality for our customer. I think we always gravitate towards and try to do made in U.S. That was our roots, right? We started in... Mm -hmm everything was produced domestically. Um, we started our international production with sweaters. Uh, there's not a lot of fully fashion sweater factories here that can do that for us. So mm -hmm. that's really been the only drive. Um, sometimes we have cost problems domestically. 
Um, but I think we're so fabric focused and our price point is such that we can usually afford to produce domestically because uh, you get such good quality. I know, you know, I've worked with Dave in LA, like you can get customized fabrics that are soft and nice. Um, so there are a lot of benefits from some quality in the US, um, sweaters or really technical outerwear I've produced internationally. Um, but I think that that's usually how we're driving our decision making, where are we going to get the best quality. Okay. Um, in speaking about um, looking towards the future, you mentioned about quality. And then on Tuesday, David asked, will you remember the comments came up about, oh, we need more machinery. Um, and your response was, well, you're not going to do all this investment unless you know that the business will be there to, to fund, right, that investment and that you can make profit. So, you know, it's interesting. I think that, you know, yes, you, there aren't uh, full fashion sweater manufacturers here in the U.S., but what, you know, David Sasso, what do you think is probably one way that we can address that? Do we say we're only going to focus on fineness and denim and everything else other people can specialize in another region? You know, what do you think is the answer for that to keep more of the manufacturing here? One is um, understanding what is here. Um, second is uh, understanding not only is it the equipment's here, but the knowledge, the know-how to do that. Um, you know, it, it's amazing um, that one knitter die house go out of business, another one pops right back up. What is it that they see that the other did not see? Um, you know, it, it's, is it because, and I know there's a, uh, a, a current plan to add another manufacturer in Georgia from knits all the way to apparel and, and prints. And the one thing he keeps saying is speed, 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 uh, and doing it right, of course. Um, but he has an idea of the overall concept, uh, but he has no orders uh, with a brand or a retailer that says, I'm going to uh, get in with you from the very beginning and you have the, uh, uh, the justification to spend the money. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what we need is trust uh, on top of uh, what is just plain market uh, situation that going forward, the U.S. needs speed. Um, but more importantly, I think the U.S., when they make something, it needs to be something special, not a commodity. Uh, but that's the, the point where the brand and retailer really needs to connect with I'm going to be investing in this uh, equipment. So what does that mean for you, for you and me? Uh, and let us make something that's truly uh, a need uh, for this hemisphere, um, whether it's fine gauge, coarse gauge, sweaters. Um, the, all these things need some type of justification for uh, investment. The banks are going to ask the same question. What makes you positive you're going to sell what you make? I got a, a list of uh, red brands and retailers ready to support me uh, on this investment. Mm -hmm. So we need trust. We need commitment. Right, right. How do you guys see um, the remainder of 2020 looking for in terms of sourcing from North America? I mean, we know um in march and april maybe even may it, the whole focus was on masks right now stores are opening up consumers are starting to venture outside maybe a little too much and now we have to close back down but how what do you guys see as sourcing looking like for the rest of the year are we still going to be making masks yes <laughs> yes yeah uh, actually i'm starting to develop three other masks as of yesterday. It's been so successful for us. I mean, maybe the comfort side um, that we're so closely tied to, like everything we want, everything we make, we want it to be really comfortable. So having that yeah. on your skin is probably mm -hmm. relevant, um, but the customers have very much responded to that. So for sure. And then also comfort. 
right? Mm-hmm. Sleep. Um, like, as we're, a lot of people are still going to need to stay home, you want to be comfortable and look cool doing it. So for us, it's going to be definitely knit um, or loungewear. Can, and, and what is that telling us that if I am going to go to make PPEs and not make uh, uh, apparel fabrics, is it because it's far more lucrative to do masks, PPEs, gowns, than it is uh, uh, clothes that we wear every single day? Something is broken here. Um, we put more focus on things you know, that uh, should cost more. Uh, We shouldn't be going to the lowest price in in apparel. Uh, We should be finding the value between price and and, uh, quality uh, uh, and design. There's there's a, when everything is based on price, and of course, man, I haven't sold the first pound of yarn except for full fashion mass uh, in PPEs. Now, why? Is it because of price and you're maximizing profits? It's, um, it's really, uh, I think there's a message here that I'd rather do PPEs than I rather than the business that actually I got into for. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of the retailers have so much inventory that you can't even, you know, um, and this is why I asked you guys, what does 2020 look like? Because I know a lot of the conversations I'm having are for developments for 2021 and 2022. I mean, obviously, because no one is producing for this year right now, but um, I'm just curious as to see what, what are your thoughts? You know, what are you thinking? Is 2020, should we all just put our gone away for vacation? See you back in 2021 when everything's ready to open. I mean, I'd like to know more about like what you guys are saying. So, so for us, we, we saw a big uptick in, in business when we opened for masks as well as for apparel. Um, but there's so much uncertainty for the next few months. We have to see where it goes. But mm-hmm. we we're very pleasantly surprised with, with the business that, that we received when we opened. Oh, okay. That's great. Yeah, Marta, just take your mood off. Yeah. Um, you know, I manufacture for um pre COVID about ninety brands. Um you know, it's been a learning curve for us on and it's been really like heartbreaking because a lot of them just unfortunately won't be able to survive or it'll take them a long time to kind of get back on their feet. Um, but the ones that pivoted quickly, um and really, um, you know, David and I work on a project together um, of a guy making sweater overalls. I mean, <laughs> he's taken this opportunity of people lounging at home, connected with his audience so beautifully, and his sales have gone crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, some brands really suffered through this time, but other brands, right. you know, had their audience engaged online more than ever before and i'm sure megan can back me up here you know people were home and not going to baseball practice and soccer practice and all these other things they were home and engaged online and so brands really kind of ran with this and a lot of brands actually grew and so Mm -hmm. you know we we really saw in our company that some of our brands are stronger than ever And some of our brands are going to have to kind of take a break or restructure, but there's very little in between space. And so um, I think 2020 is going to be for us amazing for, you know, 30 of those 90 brands. And so, you know, it was really kind of a time for a brand to really figure out how they can connect with their audience. And I think the brands that did that are going to be, you know, just fine. It, it's interesting your question, Sharon, about the sourcing for the remainder of the year, though, because at Marine Layer, we're, we try and be so focused on sustainability. And of course, when COVID happened, there was a lot of order reduction or pivots that we were forced to do to 
survive as a business, um, wanting to do those in the most sustainable way as well, and mm-hmm. also support our partners through that. Um, we're not sourcing much new. <laughs> we're trying to use what we already had that we weren't able to produce off of. So we have this massive list of uh, fabric liabilities that our goal for the remainder of 2020 and honestly into 2021 as we're producing new styles is how we can utilize the stuff that we started to produce but weren't able to go fully into uh, garments uh, next year. What does that look like next season, later this year? Uh, When can we get them in? Most, a lot of that fabric, luckily with the mass success, we've been able to pivot into some of those, but we want to waste as little as possible. So that's going to be a lot of the remainder of the year as well. Okay, thank you. And, you know, with all of that, now that's just like in sourcing and production, but we also have uh, travel restrictions, travel budget cutbacks. How are each one of you uh, navigating business, even with all of these reductions and cutbacks? Like this. <laughs> I've been stuck virtually. <laughs> virtually. You've been stuck in Texas? <laughs> I came here March 15th with two suitcases, two kids, and a husband. And we uh, thought we were going to be here for like two weeks, and we're still here. Um, but, you know, it's actually been really amazing to see how agile my company is and how much we've just kind of teamworked and kind of taken the opportunity to also be more sustainable, you know, mm-hmm. instead of having only one guy that got roles every day and that was his only job. And, you know, we kind of all kind of threw our hands in to keep the company strong and everybody kind of learned everything. And we kind of went back to that as a company, um, which has been, you know, really great. David Roshan, David? For us, we we set up our, our showroom to be able to have Zoom fabric appointments. Uh, we're working on the digital fabric library, and that's going to be our future, um, even after COVID. Um, I think that, that's, that's how we're going to see a lot of our clients. Yeah, I'm a, a relationship type of guy. I like to, to be in front of people, shake hands, touch things. It's been really hard for for me to take you know, to get used to this. Um, the hug, David. <laughs> I like to hug. Yeah, I'm a lucky. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I I hate that that. I hope that never goes away. Even uh, I, I know we have to learn new ways of doing uh, communication, but uh, I just. I haven't figured it out. This is the second best so far. I hope there's more technology um, uh, that will enhance the communication. Uh, but it's this is uh, depressing to me <laughs> that I can't go out and travel and and hug people and shake people and understand the problems and you know. So uh, what can you do? Yeah. What can you do? Um, we got one question. Um, and I saw David, you started to answer, and I'd like to just vocalize it. It says, any thoughts on how much value the brand would place on North America sourcing? David mentioned the price difference. Will brands, retailers pay more? Any examples? Thanks. And then, David, you kind of, I think you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, I've always heard a rule of thumb from brands and retailers themselves that we're willing to pay 10% more. Um, but I mentioned there is a way to calculate that, and uh, that's the value of time, uh, Sharon, that I keep talking about. Um, but the differences should be much greater uh, than 10%. The difference uh, in value is what is the risk reduction? that you have in buying apparel local versus uh, far away. Um, and there is a website, uh, OpLab, that lets you play with those numbers. But I've seen where, uh, depending on the risk, and the risk is if I don't sell it within the season and I do a cost reduction, 
for a sales price reduction, that's a, a lot more cost uh, a hit to the brand than just buying local or just buying regional. Uh, so what is that that value? And I think that's what we have to look for. Uh, I mentioned uh, yesterday, I mean not yesterday, in the last, in the first part, we have to understand what is the risk of color, the risk of uh, design. Uh, you know, when you add color, when you add certain uh, nuances to your product, that has a life. And if you don't calculate what that risk is, then you can't just say, well, I'll pay 10% more. It's, it's far greater than that. Yeah, Marcia? I think there's also some branding behind that too. Um, you know, I'm wearing an Aviator Nation hoodie. That thing, it's just not going to go on sale. And I, as a consumer, find the value in that. I, I, it. Whereas if I walk into Gap, there's no way I'm buying something full price. Like I expect a sale, and that's what that's what Gap has trained you to do. It, to expect a sale, to expect bottom dollar. Um, so it's the brands, you know, Marine Layer does a great job of this. They position themselves in a valuable light. Um, and I think that people respond to that. I think, you know, the millennials love sustainability. I think they're willing to spend that money to do those practices, how the little flag on David's mask. I mean, people do care. And so, you know, kind of branding and showing that, you know, is that that reward is far greater than, you know, a 15, 20 percent, 10 percent increase on the price of the the price of the garment. And I think that when brands can really like wrap their head around all of that, then they start to see that there's a benefit. But it's it's in their it's in their branding and their strategy because mm -hmm. marking things down. I think is very damaging to the to the value of the brand, um, and it, it's hard to kind of come back and rebrand yourself. Right. right. And you, anyone else? So you. Oh, sorry, Megan. Go ahead. I was just going to say I agree. It's definitely a more than a ten percent or a cost conversation. It's it's branding. It's sustainability. It's quality. Um, convenience to like having partners that connectivity that David was talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that you want to work with and talk to all the time that are low close by I think that there's just a cost side. Right, right. And then Marta, I like that you mentioned sustainability and about the younger consumer. There's definitely uh, a lot more awareness and a lot more demand for it. Um, you know, the old business model of our industry, um, we it's being highlighted more how broken it was and how unsustainable, right? Both economically and environmentally, right? With producing more and more and more of things that are just not moving, that are not selling. And we're there, we just keep hearing about it and there's so many issues. And there's a lot of conversation about what the future of the industry will look like. So. You know, as we reimagine the way forward, um, you know, what 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 will the future of our industry be like? Is it going to? Do we need more collaboration, uh, brand with the supplier? Do we need more innovation, such as made to order, uh, more investment, more education? You know, what do you guys think? Then then the way our industry will need to reshape in order to be successful. What, what are those things that you think will be? Well, the, the direct -to consumer brands have already started changing the game. You don't, you don't have a few retailers dictating uh, what the trends are and what everyone should buy. Um, like, like many of Marta's customers, you have um, influencers that have a great idea and can start their own company and, and focus on their customer base, their small customer base. And, work with them. So like smaller orders. S smaller orders targeted towards a specific group of people. Okay. It doesn't always mean smart smaller orders. I mean, an influencer can have 
way more reach. Um, you know, it, it's not just because it's, but their overhead is less, right? You know, maybe the influencer has one assistant and they have an idea and they're, you know, going to go with this idea. They have maybe one or two people on payroll. You know, they're mm -hmm. not these huge fashion houses that have, you know, 12 tech designers and, and, you know, all of these other expenses. And so, you know, they can, they can spend a little more on the garment, um, but they're selling it direct. So, you know, they're, they're making their margin, um, you know, for sure. They're not going to trade shows. They're not going, they're not spending all these other things that the industry really trained us we had to do. I think mm -hmm. we're finding that we actually don't have to do any of those things um, in order for a brand to be successful. We don't need a 14 piece collection. We could be successful with a one style. And so, you know, a lot of my brands might have two, three SKUs, um, but they're just matching it with those two or three SKUs. Um, and so it's, it's different, but it doesn't always yield to, you know, only 200 pieces. A lot of times, you know, we're getting much larger orders. Okay. Yes, Megan. Um, we've been talking a lot about recently about the ease of purchase. Um, so stuff that's not too fussy, that's easy to purchase and know your size. If you're loyal to a mm -hmm. brand platforming around fabrics that are successful where the customer understands what they're going to get. Um, there's obviously already been an increase in e-com because of just everything that's been going on. And I think that that will continue. So the customer being able to know and feel mm -hmm. confident that they can order something and they have an idea of what they're going to be receiving um, mm -hmm. is something we talk about a lot. Okay. I know that I mentioned, um, education and Davis asked that you and I have had a lot of those conversations that uh, and that's why I touched on it um, and I'd like uh, for you to elaborate more on in order for for this for our industry to be successful there needs to be more education more knowledge yes um, the education side uh, and this goes to um, I guess some of the uh, uh, bigger retailers and uh, and people of, of younger age that uh, are probably moving into the industry without the uh, the background. Um, but the education side, um, when I talk to people that go source uh, far away, um, they have they come back and uh, they're talking to me about sourcing here, but they have no clue how to source here. But as we talk about, well, tell me exactly the, the fabrics that you're looking for. Uh, they said, David, when I go to Asia, everything is laid out for me. And the prices are all there. And I'm just picking what I want. But here, it's like I'm lost. And I think in order to source effectively in, the, in this region, you're, you're going to have to educate yourself from fiber. What's the difference from one fiber to the other? Uh, you know, Tencel and Modell have totally different properties. Uh, Rayon has totally different properties. What's the impact of these fibers in the, in the fabric, the performance, and the cost? Um, and to make it successful, the supply chain has to make all good decisions. Everything needs to be known. If we make this decision, it impacts this. And if you're particularly talking about sustainability, just because you got one fiber and it's really sustainable, but the impact could be horrible on the other side. So that's not a sustainable decision. How do you know that before you even make the decision or before you even start making a design or, or, uh, or anything about that? You, you need to start talking about the people in the know that can help with every step of the way. Uh, I can help up to a certain point. There's another person that can help to another certain, you know, certain point. But making good decisions on the methods, the cost, and the impact of every decision in the United States or in this region will really help spur the growth and the trust that we need in, in sourcing uh, in the region. I mean, are you guys seeing the same thing, David Roshan, where you're seeing that if people have more education and more knowledge, um, it would make their decisions maybe more sensible? Yes, a lot of that has uh, a lot of 
good brands uh, like Marine Layer is um, has become very good at telling the whole story and educating the consumer on what yarns they're buying. I mean, I, up until a few years ago, I've never I've never seen anything like that before. And the cycle of the T-shirt. Um, so the successful brands are going to become more successful by educating the consumers on, on what's important, what's sustainability, and um, keep driving that. Yeah, you guys do a great job, Megan, um, for sure, on educating your consumer, you know, and like you mentioned, they are a bit more affluent. So what are, you know, the implications there? But the fact that, you know, you do charge more money, but there, there are valid reasons why it's not just this huge markup just for the sake of it. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that your customers definitely understand that and appreciate that. Um, so one thing, you know, in, in talking about education, I know that there was also, uh, we've had a couple of conversations about uh, profit distribution within the supply chain. And I think that this is a really important aspect of sourcing. So I know that in the old way of doing business, the retailer has the largest amount of profit. And everybody else, as you, the further back you go, the further down you go, the profit distribution is smaller and smaller. So for example, at Lensing, as, as a fiber manufacturer, if I'm talking to a brand, you know, a lot of times a person will sit across from the table and say, well, your, your fiber is, is a premium fiber, it's very expensive. What can you do to help me lower the price? And we're not even talking apples to apples because that person is talking about you know, uh, a garment program and, challenge, you know, and, and wanting me to lower the fiber price when the fiber has only like this much of an impact. And so, um, you know, in talking about re-education, David, you know, you mentioned, I feel like that the re-education of cost is huge. Um, and I don't, I don't have the answer on how we help to educate, but I'd love to hear from each one of you. Like David Roshan, you mentioned educating the consumers, and that is great. But um, with with the people actually in the industry, um, when we hear these questions or where they're being, you know, they're challenged by their boss, the person might have uh, good intentions and say, you know what, I'm going to go and talk to these North American suppliers. I'm going to call up Laguna Fabric. I'm going to call up Lefty Production and be like, hey, I'm going to make stuff here. But the, the we're not even speaking the same language. Our understanding is so different. Um, what what can we do to help make, have smarter conversations? Um, you know, David, Sasa, you mentioned you, you can help up to a certain point. But is there, are there any ideas? I mean, even you, Megan, as you had these conversations, you know, any ideas on what we can do as an industry here in North America? Yeah, I mean, I think education within the industry is important. So any, any mill or factory that I'm working with and we're going to costing negotiations, if it doesn't work for us at the end of the day, we won't be able to do it, but it, I expect and I hope that everyone I'm working with is as transparent with me as I am with them. Um, because if it doesn't work for you, then it's not a good partnership either. So I think that there has to be this open communication um, where you don't just, you don't take, you don't just do a lower cost because that's what the retailer is telling you that they want. It's like a dialogue and you you have this margin threshold that you can't compromise that I always work better with people when I know that I'm like, okay, so this is the line that you need to hit. I don't want you to not be successful in your business either. So how can we work together to make that work for both of us? If I bought in mass more, or if I platformed against it in a different way, or I was just on the call with um, a mill in LA yesterday saying that this one fabric's a little bit expensive for us right now. Do you have any recommendations on how we could make it better together? Uh, I think you have to make sure that each piece of the puzzle vocalizes what they need and doesn't compromise um, at their detriment. 
Um, mm -hmm. and then you work collaboratively to make that work. So I think honestly, those relationships and communication, like open dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, we're coming down to uh, towards the end of our hour. And one last thing that I'd like each one of you to share before we close out is in our conversation, if there was one thing that you would like uh, the listeners to, to have as a takeaway, what would that be? Go ahead, Marta. I think also, you know, I love what Megan just said about this collaboration. It's like when these, they, we're, we're fewer than they are, right? There's, there's more brands than there are factories. <laughs> there are, are more brands than there are the two Davids. Um, the brands need us to be healthy so that we can be there for them. And I think COVID really painted that picture, you know, because so many people were rushing and, and needed us. So it's like you need your supply chain healthy too. Um, and so, you know, the people that, you know, luckily, Thank God we're in a position where there are enough people reshoring. Um, there are, there is enough supply and demand. There is enough demand for domestic that I think the, you know, it's important for me that I'm paying my sewers properly. And mm -hmm. I don't want to work with a brand that wants me to only be paying minimum wage. I don't pay minimum wage. I don't. And so I don't want those brands. And so mm -hmm. I think that suppliers need to start being choosier about which brands are going to succeed. Um, you know, we don't, you know, the, the brands that are the fashion novas of LA that are, you know, taking all the sellers, treating them badly. Like we, the suppliers need to stop letting those people succeed and let the people that are willing to collaborate with you willing to educate their educate on why it should be this mm -hmm. those are the brands that the suppliers need to start really favoring i think and so mm -hmm. you know i think it kind of with education is also kind of instead of just favor favoriting oh this is a thousand unit cut um you know well maybe marine layer has a you know 500 piece cut but they're willing to pay an extra dollar fifty like then it starts to the economics start to work. And so mm -hmm. I think that, you know, really choosing the partners is really important for domestic manufacturing because there's not that, that much of it. Still, there's a, there's a big ramp up period that needs to happen um, to, to get there. Yeah, thank you. Great. David, the Davids, as we're calling you, <laughs> any <laughs> last words? <laughs> can you I think Martha said, said all the right things. Uh, congratulations. Uh, it, it is collaboration. It is education. Uh, and there's uh, people in our industry that would just love to help. Um, and if we can just know each other, uh, see each other. Uh, I, I can't take a video and take you out to the facility and explain all the nuances we have as compared to somebody that's 10 times uh, our size. But, um, you know, it's a wonderful thing when you have a supply chain that is collaborative and it is uh, transparent. transparent. Mm -hmm. I, I want to help the industry seeing how they shared resources and information to put together the supply chain to make PP, PPEs. Um, and I think that's going to continue the collaboration and the value that people see in, in having the infrastructure here in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we have collaboration and partnership and trust. I like that. And, you know, those are words that can be applied to anything. So thank you so much to each one of you for spending this hour with me to chat and uh, for your last words. And with that, uh, I'd like to have this closing remark. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. And I think that's so important. If people say, I can't source from North America, then you know what? You can. If you say, I can't, then guess what? You're not going to be able to make it happen. So 
Thank you very much. And Maureen Mayer has been very gracious to extend a promo code to everybody who's listening today. I'll be sending that out at a thank you note. So go and shop sustainable apparel made in the USA. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day and a safe 4th of July.